Good morning. <laughs> and happy Mother's Day to Father, all of you moms. We honor you today. Hope your day is special. Welcome also to moms and others joining us via live streaming. I want to pray and join your faith along with mine as we pray for this service today. Father, we thank you that Jesus rules and reigns on the earth today. We thank you that nothing is too hard for you today. Father, I pray for your presence to be among us in a wonderful way. I pray that you will build up people, strengthen people, release more love, peace, joy, and faith amongst your people today. Lord, especially bless moms today. Oh, God, even in this service, let moms feel your love, your favor. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship Amen. God together. I will worship, I will worship. 
Focus on me, says the Lord. Do not focus on the things of this world. Do not focus on the fears and the things that happen around you. Focus on me, says the Lord. When you pray to me and you ask for something specific, but yet your focus is on the world, is on fears, and on other things, you cannot receive what I have to give to you today. Just like when Peter was walking on water, but he took his eyes off of me, says the Lord, and started to focus on the wind and the surroundings around him, and he started to sink. Do not be like that. Focus on me, says the Lord, and you will receive what I want to give you according to my will. Joseph walked up, I felt just fire burning in me. And I heard the Lord say that he's extending his scepter of righteousness. And I heard the Lord say that even as we were singing that all the earth shall know him and shall sing his praise, he said all the earth will know that I truly am God. I heard him say, that he is changing things he's coming with a scepter of righteousness things will change says the lord things will change towards righteousness says the lord and i heard the lord say that look to him look to him don't look to the world don't look to other things but look to him for he is the one who is bringing change he is the one who is sifting and shifting things and i heard the lord say will you believe for the miracle will you believe for the miracle will you believe for the miracle if you will lift your faith and believe the Lord says I have already done it I have already done it says the Lord for I truly am a God that comes on your behalf I truly am God that comes as the Almighty one in your life I've already done it says the Lord look to me look to me and I just saw things shifting and changing and I saw it even over the next month that things are shifting and changing things are shifting and changing and all the earth will know that he truly is God all the earth will know he truly is the Almighty One hallelujah Praise you.
I've grown them, but that doesn't mean I don't believe that there's something bigger than me. Cause I've seen it in a hospital when the doctor said sorry. There's nothing more we can do, but he wasn't true. I've never seen a part of food. I didn't handle the rainbow, but I got a promise I can hold. In a minute of the struggle, God, if you said it, you perform it. May not be how I want you to, but you will I. Steps. Yeah, you are the author, but there's no predicting what is next. But you hold the future, and all the questions they come second to the one I know is true. You always be.
just on Sundays. He wants to give you strength every day. And as we wait upon him, he renews our strength. I, I always think about it like this smartphone starts to run low. It needs to be plugged in, and as it's plugged in, it recharges. Sometimes you and I run a little low. Life sucks us a little dry. But when we're Waiting on him, it's like we've just plugged our spirit into the most powerful source that there is. And every one of us have that access. Well, I want us to pray for the moms today. If your mother is here, uh, go near her. If uh, the mother of your children is near, go near her. Becky, why don't you come and join me up here? 
Maybe your mom is not here, but far away. Lift up your mom in prayer wherever she may be. And I realize for some of you, maybe your mom has already gone to be with the Lord. But may today be a day of wonderful memories. Let's pray for the moms that are here and elsewhere. Father, we thank you for our mothers. Lord, they sacrifice so much. And I pray today that every mother listening will feel appreciated and honored and encouraged. Lord, we thank you for these women of valor. We thank you, Lord, for these women who sacrifice much for the well-being of their families. Lord, today we say thank you to the moms. We say we honor you, moms. We love you. We appreciate you. Lord, for families today that gather, bless the gatherings. And again, may every mom feel appreciated and celebrated. Lord, for moms that are separated by miles, we thank you for them wherever they are. Bless the moms wherever they are today. Lord, for those who have lost mothers, we thank you for the memories. We thank you, Lord, for what every mom has invested in her household. So bless, bless, bless these moms, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Greet the moms. Give them a big round of applause. Bless you, mothers. You may be seated. And moms, you may have seen as you were coming in, we have a gift for you. So on your way out, be sure and pick up the gift. For the offering, I want to read 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You are reaping right now based on what you sowed in the last season. You are determining what you're going to reap in the next season by what you're sowing now. If you want a really big garden this fall, guess what? It's not that complicated. Just plant lots of seeds, right? I mean, it's really quite simple. So if you want to reap generously, then sow accordingly. I'm going to ask uh, a couple of our ladies here are going to come do a song. Maybe some of the musicians are joining them. You can get in place for that song. But to give it jubilee, we do have four buckets, two in the front, two in the back. Anytime during the service, you can put your offering in those buckets. Those of you who are watching online, there should be a button close by. You can click and uh, participate in the giving if you'd like to do that today. Of course, any of you can set up giving on uh, auto pay with your bank or on the church website. All right. Go ahead and share your song with us today.
maybe dismissed for children's church and uh, I'm gonna ask Pastor Buddy to come and as he's getting ready I want to remind you we did start a class Wednesday on how to transform your world by loving your neighbor it will only be three more sessions it's from 6 to 645 if you didn't make the first session you're welcome to still join us this coming Wednesday we'll give you some notes from last week and then corporate prayer, besides every Wednesday from 7 to 8, we do one Friday a month, second Friday of the month, an extended time from 6 to 8. And that will be this Friday. So we'd love to have you come and join us in prayer. Pastor Buddy, come greet us. Let us know what's going on. Praise the Lord, everybody. I thought today was Sunday. Is today Monday? No. Or I think they think they at work or something, so they can't really praise the Lord. Let's try this one more time. Just in case you didn't know, today is Sunday. Amen. Just, may, maybe you didn't know. Maybe maybe you didn't know that you are in the house of God. Amen. So so that means you can stand to your feet if you're able and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hey, there we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. There we go. Listen, listen, listen. Only reason I do that is because I want to make sure you get your praise in. Amen. Because as much as I don't want to say it, but it's very possible that when we walk out that door, God called us home. Amen. And I want to make sure you got your praise in before you went home. Amen. So my job is to make sure you get your praise in, but I'm, let me stop because I'm, I'm taking too much time. Let me stop. All right. So I got, I got uh, two announcements that I have to get out. So the first one is um, the camp. For those parents who want to send their kids to camp, whether it's teen camp or kids camp, we're going to have a meeting on Wednesday 
this Wednesday at 6.30 in the youth room. It shouldn't be more than 30 minutes. So please, if you are interested in getting your kids to camp, please come. I need to talk to you. We need to get some information to you. Timeline is really short. It came up on us really fast. Amen? All right. So because of camp, uh, we selling tickets for our fundraiser. Amen? Yeah. Who's cooking? It's a beautiful fundraiser done by the youth. I'm really excited. You can buy your tickets. Uh, you see the table out there. It's really pretty. It's super gala, eventy type of a thingy, if that's a real word. So if you do come, please come in your best dressed. I ain't saying you got to go buy a, a bow tie or nothing like that. But what I am saying, if you come in here in shorts and a tank top, people going to look at you crazy. All right. So just come in your best dress, whatever that looks like. We would love to have you. If you want to support a kid, um, you can always go to our website, jubileewc.org. On our website, you can go to the tab that says Give, and it says Youth Camp, and you can give to the camp and just let us know um, that you did that, and that'll help us as we are putting our stuff together. But also, if you want to buy a ticket, you can also buy a ticket on our website, all right? So that's all my announcements, and then Thursday night, Bible study with Buddy. It's awesome. Uh, we'd love to see you. If any have questions, let me know. God bless you. Amen. Donald, you look hot. I see you, Doc. <laughs> All right, well, we are in a series of messages on the theme, Understanding the Times, a series based on 1 Chronicles 12, 32, where it says the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. As you know, we live in some crazy, challenging times, but I believe God wants to give us some insight into what is going on in our day and that he tells us what we can do in response to the times in which we live and, of course, that we follow through. The last two Sundays, we've been focusing specifically on the cancel culture cancel. And I've been pointing out that there is a culture today that is trying to restrict us from some of our religious freedoms as well as some of our freedoms of speech. I mentioned last week that the cancel culture that we are facing today tends to try to cancel what it cannot control or cancel anything that questions or brings a different narrative than the one being promoted. It is vital that we realize as followers of Jesus, we must stand up for the moral truths of Scripture and of the Gospel and not allow our voice as followers of Jesus to be silenced. How does the cancel culture try to silence us? We've been touching on four predominant ways. One is censoring social media. Another is labeling those who disagree, often with terms that are very negative. Passing laws to incriminate uh, those who disagree. And also misrepresenting the truth and lying, whether intentional or unintentional, it may happen uh, either way. I came across a couple of articles this past week uh, I thought I would highlight because it goes along so well uh, with our subject. This is from the Christian Post, and uh, this heading says, Christian Member of Parliament Faces Six Years in Prison for Tweeting Bible Verses on Marriage and sexuality. This is actually in Finland. I'm going to read some of the highlights. A Christian member of the Finnish parliament is facing six years imprisonment for sharing her religious beliefs on marriage and human sexuality. She is a medical doctor, a mother of five, and a grandmother of six. She said, quote, my statements were all based on the Bible's teachings on marriage and sexuality. I will not back down from my views. I will not be intimidated into hiding my faith. And listen to this last sentence. The more Christians keep silent, 
on controversial themes, the narrower the space for freedom of speech gets, end quote. I saw another article also in the Christian Post. The heading says 43 major companies oppose Texas bills to protect girls sports, ban trans experimentation on kids. Let me read that to you, our excerpts of it. Two bills were passed in the Senate in Texas. They're now being considered by the state's House of Representatives. One bill would protect girls' sports by banning biological males from participating in female sports. The other bill would ban experimental puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and the genital mutilation of minors suffering from gender dysphoria. I want you to notice this bill bans those things not for adults, but for minors. But, but, 43 major companies signed a statement opposing those two bills. Let me see if you've heard of any of these companies. I'm not going to read 43, but here's a few you've probably heard of. Amazon, American Airlines, United Airlines. There's not many airlines we can fly on anymore that's neutral in these areas. Um, Apple, Dell, Dow, Facebook. IBM, Microsoft, PayPal, and a host of others. We cannot give in to the cancel culture while at the same time fulfilling the Great Commission. Because the Great Commission requires that we share Jesus and share the truths of God's word with all humanity. Whether or not it is Popular, whether or not it is considered politically correct. It is sad that we have come to a place where some of the truths of God's word are now being considered hate speech. And as I've been trying to emphasize all along, it is so important that as we live out our faith, that we do so in great love and compassion, and we'll hopefully continue to emphasize that. We must obey God rather than man. We emphasized that last week, Acts 4 and 5. The cancel culture, while the terminology may be new, the principle is nothing new. The early church had a cancel culture come against them and tried to make their message that they were promoting illegal. But they came to a place where they kept praying for boldness, prayed for miracles, and they came to a place where they said, we must obey God rather than man. Now, sometimes we can obey both. But sooner or later, there tends to come a time where what God says and what man says clash. And at that point, we all have a decision to make, will I obey God or man and will I obey God even if it costs me something? It costs them something. They were persecuted. In fact, it's incredible. They actually got beaten and then released. And it says they went away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Perhaps the cost of worshiping and serving God is going to become higher before it becomes lower. Will we rise up and be like the church of Acts and be willing to pay whatever it costs us to live as the salt and light that God wants us to live in the day in which we live? To keep us centered in everything that's going on, I want to give you a verse I read last week, wasn't in your notes, but Romans 12, it should be in your notes today, Romans 12, verses 17 and 21, it says, repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men, do not be overcome by evil, here it is, but overcome evil with what? With good. You see, what can happen is we can get all stirred up over all the things going on, and we can respond to the right thing in the wrong way. We, we can let our flesh get stirred up, 
and, and try to fight evil with evil. That doesn't work. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So what you and I have to do is put the flesh under and fight evil in the opposite spirit. And that is fight evil with good. Even in Matthew 5, Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Toward the end of the message last week, I mentioned that God is about to cancel some of the cancel culture. I shared with you the trap principle that some will set a, who are setting a trap for others are going to be caught in that same trap themselves. Psalm 916, while the wicked are digging a pit for others, they're actually setting the terms for their own judgment. They will fall into their open pit. Proverbs 29, 16, when the wicked are in power, lawlessness abounds. There are some wicked people in power today. The result of that is lawlessness is abounding. Lawlessness is on the increase, but there's a second half to that verse. It says, but, but the righteous will see their fall. We're going to see the fall of some of the cancel culture. But I have another warning to keep you centered when this happens. It's Proverbs 24, 17. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. When we see these things come to pass, it's vital that we stay humble and that we recognize, but by the grace of God, there go I, and that we humble ourselves before the sight of the Lord, lest we go the same path. We also looked last week at the law of sowing and reaping, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, which basically says that for every action, good or bad, there's a consequence. That passage says that God is not Ma, that those who sow to the flesh will reap corruption. So those who have mocked God and mocked the ways of God and the people of God, there, there is a price that will be paid. There is a corruption. There is a sowing that is going to, or a reaping uh, from what has been sowed. And we're going to see some of that in the days ahead. Lastly, before we jump into uh, some new territory today, uh, I mentioned from the book of Esther that Haman uh, wanted to cancel the Jews, especially a Jew by the name of Mordecai. <clears throat> he had a gallows built. The plan was to hang Mordecai and then cancel out the Jewish culture. But God intervened, and guess who ended up being hung on that gallows? It was not Mordecai. It was not one of the Jews. It was Haman. It was the one who had set the trap and he got caught in his own trap. There are some Hamans down the road a bit <clears throat> that are going to find themselves <clears throat> hanging on the very gallows that they have created for others. And I'm, of course, speaking figuratively. Mostly figuratively. <laughs> Today what I want to do is tell you three stories Two of them from the book of Daniel, one from Genesis 11. All three of these stories continue to support this idea of God canceling out some of the cancel culture. As I mentioned last week, I don't know when these things will begin to happen. I feel in my spirit soon. I don't know to what extent. I don't know how God is going to do it. But I believe that God is going to do it in such a way that we will know it was God and that it wasn't anything man made happen. I think what's been happening is God's been just patiently standing back waiting for man to exhaust all of his own plans until we've come to a place where we realize, okay, we've done everything we can and, and it's still broken. God, I guess you're going to have to do it. And God will say, well, that's what I've been waiting for. So let me tell you three stories. The first one is three men in a three men in a furnace, or was that four? 
that's the story we're going to look at from Daniel, the first three chapters. At the time of Daniel being written, it centers around Babylon, which was a pagan nation. And the king of Babylon at the time was a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. How would you like to sign that name every time you signed your name? But anyway, Nebuchadnezzar decided that he wanted to recruit some of Israel's brightest young men and teach them the language and, and bring them through some training and make them leaders in his kingdom. So he went through an extensive interview process and ended up bringing, again, some of the Jews' youngest, brightest into Babylon to be a part of his kingdom. Uh, many of you will be familiar with some of these names. The four that are highlighted in the book of Daniel are, of course, Daniel, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, God gave these men such favor that they excelled, it tells us, in all matters of wisdom and understanding. In fact, Daniel 1.20 tells us that these men were ten times better than all their other peers. I don't know if that's literal or figurative, but imagine, ten times better. And what I want to just say to you about that is that God can give you favor. God can give you skills and abilities that surpass others if we are yielded to him and we want to be used by him to advance his purposes god can do the same with us today well sometime later nebuchadnezzar made a gold image 90 feet high and nine feet wide can you imagine how much that would be worth today gold <laughs> 90 feet high, 9 feet wide, and he invited and actually required all of his leaders to come to the dedication of this image. I don't know if it was an image of himself or some other god, but at any rate, he said this to everybody, when the music starts, I want all of you to bow down to this image. And if you don't, you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. Cancel culture. You do what we tell you to do or we will take you out. You don't have a right to worship how you want to worship. We're going to tell you who and when and when not. So again, we see this pressure. But if I don't bow... I'm going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. So the music sounded, and everybody bowed except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. By the way, there's nothing about Daniel in that part of the, the book, and so I'm guessing maybe he was out of town on business or something. But at any rate, because he was one of the top three governors uh, in the land, but at any rate, they don't bow. So they're brought before the king, and he is steaming hot that they didn't bow. And he's like, okay, maybe you guys didn't hear me, so I'll give you one more chance. When you hear the music, you've got to bow, or you're going to be thrown in the fire furnace. You got that. They said, well, king, yeah, we, we heard you the first time, but we can't bow. Our God is able to protect us, and our God will protect us. But even if he doesn't, we would rather burn than bow. So no, we are not going to bow. That's the kind of resolve that God wants in us today. So the king was so angry, he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter. Can you imagine that? How do you heat a furnace like seven times hotter? So. They were tied up, tossed into this fiery furnace, heated up seven times hotter, and it was so hot that the men who threw them in died from even being that close to the heat. In other words, some of team cancel culture got canceled real quick. The fire 
prepared for others was the very fire that took some of them out. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's watching this whole thing. Remember how angry he is? And he's like rubbing his eyes like, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're walking. They're not burning up. They're not screaming in terror. The fire's not consuming them. And they went in tied up. They're walking. But he's like, wait a minute. How many did we throw in? Three. That's what I thought. But I count four. And the fourth one is like a son of God. And he is so amazed, he calls them out of the fire. They come out of the fire. And the Bible says that not a hair of their head was singed. It says that there was not one burn mark on their clothing. It literally says the fire had no power over them and they did not even smell like smoke. If you and I do not bow to the enemy, God will stand up for us. If you and I are willing to go through the fire for God, God will go through the fire with us. Sometimes you and I may come out of the fire and we're all beat up, burned. We smell like smoke. We're... <laughs> Let me suggest that perhaps, perhaps if when we come out of the fire we smell like smoke, something's off. Perhaps the fire inside us is just not hot enough. I remember decades ago hearing a, a preacher say the key to not burning in the fire is to have the fire inside of you hotter than the fire on the outside of you. There was something that burned, though, that day, besides those who threw them into the fire. What burned is the ropes that bound them. Think of it. That's the only thing that burned off is the, the ropes that were binding them so that they could be free, so that they could walk and worship God. As fire comes, God wants the fire to simply refine us, not to scorch us, not to take us out, but to burn up the chaff, to burn up those things that are keeping us in bondage. The king did an amazing thing. He was so moved by this manifestation of God's protection that he worshiped God, a God he really didn't know, he worshiped God, and he issued an executive order that if anybody speaks against their God, they're going to get canceled. Now, that's a bit of a shift in like a, a hurry. I believe that as God does supernatural things in and through his people, we're going to see some people so impacted in the political arena and other arenas that some are going to shift gears and now stand up for the preservation of religious freedom and liberties. Let's go to another story, one you're probably also very familiar with, Daniel and the lion's den. So now Nebuchadnezzar's gone. We're talking quite a number of years later. And now there's another king in charge by the name of Darius. Darius really liked Daniel. As I mentioned earlier, Daniel became one of the three governors over the area. And the king actually was thinking, I don't know how many people knew about it, but it says the king was actually thinking of making Daniel in charge of everything. Of course, some of his peers got jealous of that. I mean, he's an outsider and he's going to rule over us. So they did what the Ganso culture does, and they schemed for a way to impeach Daniel. Now, Daniel is one of the most unique characters in, in all of the Bible. There's only a few like him in that he's one of the only people in the Bible we never see messed up. Now, he probably messed up at some point. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible never tells us anything about Daniel in terms of some sin or some, you know, judgment of error or, or whatever. In fact, it says that he, he had an excellent spirit. 
He was a righteous, godly man. Now, what, what does the world do when it tries to take somebody out? It tries to find the skeletons in the closet. It tries to dig up the dirt. Most people have some dirt, right? But they couldn't find anything on Daniel. He was squeaky clean. Now, what does the world do if it can't find anything? Well, they usually make something up. Why didn't they make something up on Daniel? I think they realized he's so squeaky clean. If we make something up, they'll know it's not true. <laughs> so they decided, I think the only way we can bring Daniel down is if we use his faith in God against him. I think that's the only way we can get this guy impeached. So they, they went to Darius. They didn't tell him what they had in mind for Daniel. And I think that in a weak moment, Darius gave in to his vanity, his pride. Here's what they schemed. They probably buttered Darius up and they said, Darius, you're such a wonderful king and blah, blah, blah. So here, here's what we think we should do to honor you, Darius. If for, how about if for the next 30 days... Nobody can petition any god except you, Darius, or they'll be thrown into a lion's den. Again, that fed his pride, fed his vanity, so he agreed to it, and he signed an executive order to that end. So, the uh, warning went out. Daniel heard it, but do you know what Daniel did? in response to that executive order and the impeachment and being thrown into a dental line. Do you know how he responded to that? He ignored it. He ignored it. Now, I want to ask you something. Picture yourself as Daniel, and you just heard this. How would you have reacted? I can tell us, I can tell you what, some of us would do. Maybe none of us here, but here's what some people would do. God, I'm no good to you, Dad. So, God, I just, I'm just not going to pray to you just for 30 days. Just for 30 days, God, because, again, I'm no good to you, Dad. So, I'm not going to give up my faith, but, but God, I'm just not going to pray for the next 30 days, and then God will reconnect, and, and we'll be really good from then on. So, so we're all good, right, God? Daniel could have done that. Now, none of you would have done that, but some people would have done that. Well, m maybe we can make a compromise, okay? Because here's what Daniel did. Daniel's custom, he didn't do anything different. He didn't go, like, out of his way to do something different. What his custom was, was to pray to God right by his open window three times a day. And he just kept doing that. But here's what he could have done. He could have done this. He could have said, well, God... Um, again, I'm no good to you, Dad, so I'm going to pray, God, but I'm going to shut the window, and I'm going to pray under my breath so nobody will know I'm praying. So, God, I'm still praying. I'm just not praying out loud. Now, some might think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, think about it. If Daniel had done that, he would have compromised his devotion and worship to God to please man and to save his own skin. And he just wasn't willing to do that no matter what it costs him. So the cancel culture set up their surveillance, and yes, they caught Daniel praying. Surprise, surprise, surprise. So they, they took Daniel and they brought him before King Darius and the Bible says King Darius was mad at himself. Why? Because he really liked Daniel. And he's like, what did they talk me into? Why, why, did, I, why did I give in to that? He was upset with his self, with, uh, of himself. He actually was trying to find a way to see if he could acquit Daniel. But because the executive order had already been written and they knew it, there was really no legal way he could get Daniel out of this. And so he turned Daniel over to them. They threw Daniel in the lion's den and put a, a stone over the mouth of the lion's den and put the uh, signet, the seal from the king's uh, ring so that they knew nobody could mess with it. And that night, the king could not sleep. He was so upset because he so liked and respected Daniel and he was so mad at himself that he had given in to this. 
And he actually said before he put Daniel in the lion's den, he said, Daniel, may your God save you. So early the next morning after not having slept, he runs out and he goes up to the, the, the lion's den and he says, Daniel, Daniel, did your God save you? And he listened and he heard Daniel say, it's all good, king, just chilling. Last night, God sent, an, my God sent an angel who shut the lion's mouth, and I slept pretty well, thank you. That's the MJV, Mark Johnson version. So the king was so happy that he had the stone rolled away, and you know the story. The cancel culture, you remember the group that tried to take Daniel out? Darius ordered that they would get thrown into the den of lions. The trap they had set for Daniel, they now were thrown into. And the Bible says, the, this is kind of graphic, but the Bible says that the lions literally crushed their bones before their bodies ever even hit the ground. And then Darius issued another executive order saying, everybody in my kingdom must fear the God of Daniel. Again, when he encountered the power of God, he shifted his perspective and decided to stand up for the religious freedom of people like Daniel, and I believe we're going to see some people today do the same thing. I've got one more story from Daniel. We're going to go back in time about 1,600 years earlier, all the way to Genesis chapter 11. And the Bible tells us that at that time in history, and I really sense there's something very, very prophetic about this passage, and what I mean by that is I, I believe there's some details here that have an amazing application to what we're facing. So at that time, all the world spoke one language. Basically, it was one group of people, all spoke the same language, and they were united in building a city and a tower that would reach into the heavens. The problem was that was not what God wanted them to be building. It was out of pride, and they were trying to stay united over this amazing building project. And the Bible says that God decided to come down and check it out. I know you know this, but whenever God comes down to check something out, it's not because he couldn't tell in heaven what was going on. No, God is all-knowing. He doesn't have to come down to see if what he heard was true. But when God comes to check something out, it's really showing us that he's a personal God. He's a God that wants to be personally and intimately involved in the affairs of the world and in the affairs of mankind. It's God saying, not just I'm going to come and see what's going on, it's God saying I'm going to come and, uh, and uh, mix things up a little bit here. So what does God do? By the way, before God does this, he says, and this is so amazing, he said because... They are united, he said, nothing they determine would be withheld from them. That is so incredible. That even though what they were determined to do, what they were united to accomplish was against God, God said, unity is so powerful, they will accomplish it if I don't do something to disrupt that unity. So, what does God do? God divides their languages. Let me say it another way. What God did is he brought division into their communication. He brought disruption into their communication. Mark 3.24 says, A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. 
So what God was doing is he was taking this kingdom that was not divided against itself, and he's like, I'm going to divide it against itself so that it cannot stand. So he, he disrupted their ability literally to communicate, and he scattered them. And the Bible says the city ceased to continue being built. And then God gave the city a name and called it Babel. Babel ceased. One wonders if God had not come and disrupted their unity and brought a scattering of their unity. One wonders what would that city have looked like. Well, I believe today, today, there is a unity of seeking to build an America that is not the America that our founding fathers built and envisioned for its future. Today, there is a group of people that are trying to rebuild America to look more like Babylon than America. On one level, it is scary to think of how much unity there is in rebuilding this new America. Think of it. We have those that we might consider on the far left, far liberal scale of things. They are united with another group, the much of the social media, much of the mainstream media. Now we see that some of the big tech, big pharma, big businesses are also united to rebuild this America into something different than we've ever seen. Much of Hollywood is on what I'm referring to as team cancel culture. They have joined the team. Now, professional sports has joined team cancel culture. And as I look at the amazing unity of all these powerful groups, I am overwhelmed by how much unity this group has for this city they're trying to build. But I believe God might be <laughs> on his way down. He, he's, either, he's either just on his way down or just getting ready, and he's saying, like in Genesis 11, I'm going to come, check things out. I'm going to come, check things out. Not because I don't know what's going on, but because it's time for Babylon to come down. By the way, it comes down in the book of Revelation. Ba uh, Babylon city comes down. And I believe God is coming down to get personally involved because I don't believe the direction America is going is the direction God wants it to go. I just thought for a while, a few times here in the last maybe month, what would happen if God didn't come down? What would happen if this unity continued? What would America look like? And I don't want to think very long about what that America will look like, but I can tell you it's the America we are going to experience if God does not come down. But I believe God is coming down and I believe what we are going to see is we're going to begin to see a disruption in that unity I described earlier. We're going to begin to see some interesting communication disruptions. We're going to begin to see some of what has been united become scattered because God is not going to let America go to hell in a handbasket, not as long as there is a remnant calling out to God, seeking him. 
Well, what should we do about all this? I'll close just a couple of minutes here. I went over this quickly last week. I'll go over it again this week. Probably, probably do one more message on this, and then I don't know if the series will be done or not, but there's one more message that I have burning in me. But real quickly, if you're a citizen of the United States, here's a couple of things. Share this information with others, but do so respectfully. Use wisdom and discernment. Remember, Jesus said not to cast your pearls before swine. In other words, there's some people that you just shouldn't probably share with. It just won't be effective. Let God give you discernment as to who you should talk to and who not. Secondly, know and exercise your constitutional rights as a U.S. citizen, but do so with love and respect. Remember, if, if we don't stand up for those rights, we will lose them. You may want to consider partnering with other like-minded people because in the political arena, numbers make a difference. Sometimes circulating petitions can be an effective strategy. Number three, inform your legislatures and U.S. senators where you stand on moral issues and encourage them to do the right thing. They're supposed to represent the people. But if, if we as believers never share moral truths with them, what, what else are they going to hear? We need to be salt and light and communicate our values and give them an opportunity to hear us and consider responding appropriately. And number four, consider, I'm not telling you to do this, but consider boycotting cancel culture businesses. Do you know what speaks the loudest to most businesses? A loss of revenue. Now, if you do that, there's so many now, you probably can't do them all. You may need to pick just a few. If you do that, you may want to, like, write a letter or talk to somebody in authority. Let them know. As long as you take this particular stance, I will be doing business elsewhere. But if you change your mind, I'll be happy to come and be one of your customers again. So consider that. Then as citizens of the kingdom of God, in addition to those things, pray, pray, and pray some more. And let me say this, prayer must be the first thing, the most important thing. All the things we can do as a citizen will probably do very little if it's not backed up by prayer. Prayer is the most important thing we can do. Pray, you might want to do some fasting along with your prayer. And then let God tell you what to do. God will steer you, and he may give each of us a unique assignment. And then know and exercise your responsibilities as a child of God in a Christ-reflecting, honoring way. How does God want you and I to live as salt and light in this world? How does he want us to let our lights shine before others? So, in closing, there is, as I've been mentioning, a cancel culture trying to silence, restrict religious freedoms and freedom of speech. But we are called to speak the truth in love, Stand up for what is right. Remember, God is about to cancel some of the cancel culture. I'll just say one of them I see coming. I think we're going to see professional sports take a big, big hit. Now, I love sports. I love professional sports. But I, I, I believe if professional sports continues in the direction they are uh, going, they are going to lose a significant viewership. They're going to lose a large amount of revenue. And I predict, prophesy, whatever you want to call it, they're going to come to a place where they can no longer pay such exorbitant salaries. They will take a hit. Well, let's stand and close in prayer. And as we, as we close in prayer, I want to encourage you, join us Wednesday nights. If, you, if at all possible, even if it's not every Wednesday, but there's probably not a lot you could be doing that would be more impactful than coming together with your church family, and praying for our nation and for the church and one another. And no, we don't put you on the spot to pray out loud. So we would love to have you come, as well as the Friday nights. And 
Let's be encouraged by these stories in the scriptures today. Let's be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not going to bow. We're going to stand strong and trust God to protect us. Let's be like Daniel. We're not going to take a step back in our faith. We're going to trust God. If he has to, he'll send his angels to silence the mouths of the lions. Let's pray together. As I close in prayer, I'm going to ask any prayer teams that are serving today to come and be available. After the closing prayer, you're welcome to go. Moms, be sure and pick up a gift on your way out. If anybody here today is not right with God, you've strayed from God and you need to come back to God, or maybe you've just never really connected with God, this would be a wonderful day to give your life to God or to come back to God. He's waiting for you. He's inviting you. He longs to forgive you and to welcome him, welcome you in his family. If that's you, before you go, why don't you come and let one of the prayer teams pray with you. Father, we thank you that you are all powerful, that you are concerned about the things we face in our life especially those things that go against your purposes. But we thank you, God, that with all of the things going on, there is great hope, great hope, great hope for those who follow you. We thank you, God, that we can have your peace in the midst of life storms. We can have your joy in the midst of turmoil. And we thank you, God, that we can walk by faith no matter what is going on around us. Help us, I pray, as your church in these days, Lord, to be strong. Lord, help us to seek your face. Help us to be strong. Help us to not back down. Lord, give us boldness. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, let your love and compassion flow through us to a hurting, confused world. May we each one be salt and light in the various contexts in which you have put us. As we close this service, we thank you, God, that you are going to move in this nation. You are calling this nation back to you. We thank you that we're seeing evidences of it. We're seeing like the cloud the size of a man's hand enough that encourages our faith to know you are up to something. And we look forward to what you're going to be doing in the days ahead of us. I pray special blessing on all the family gatherings that happen today. Bless each household, strengthen our families, encourage them, and Lord, especially let our moms feel loved on today, appreciated and valued, not only today, but every day. We bless the moms, and everybody said amen, amen. God bless you. We love you. We love you, moms.